Port Mini is a quiet oceanside corner of the city of Oxford, California area is known for its strawberry production. You can hardly get in or out of Oxnard without driving past massive fields of them. And during the summer, the smell of strawberries is constantly hanging in the air. Unfortunately, in early June 1993, the aroma of fresh fruit was probably the last thing on the minds of 11-year-old Andrew and for Austin. Because that morning, just after Memorial Day weekend, their lives changed forever when their mother, Norma Rodriguez, was found strangled to death, her head wrapped in duct tape. It was Tuesday morning, and it was the morning after the Memorial Day weekend on June 1, 1993. A house that was once a home becomes a crime scene. When I got here I met the estranged husband of the victim and his brother. They were seen to be in a panic and they told me to come in the front door. Dennis Fitzgerald is a homicide detective with the Port Wynamey Police Department inside the house. Andrew Rodriguez is 11 years old and watches as they cut duct tape off the body of his mother Norma Rodriguez was checking the pulse. The first thing I did was I get out of scissors, and cut the tape. She was still alive. And when he cut the tape, I saw her face and she was white, like to go. So that's when I knew that she was there already. Rodriguez has been strangled to death, her head wrapped entirely in tape. It was pretty up close and personal with the strangulation and the duct tape, which I know we had never seen a homicide like that before that duct tape was ever used in a homicide. This was his or her way of putting some kind of a blindfold on this person so that, they wouldn't have to look at her while they were doing what they were doing from a forensic standpoint, the crime scene is clean, no sign of rape, no bodily fluids to work, with no unknown prints lifted. There is, however, at least one rather large clue. And it involves Norma Rodriguez's house keys, which disappeared days before the murder on Lee to reappear at the crime scene. The keys became very important because then we realized that the keys had been missing. Missing, and all of a sudden the house was thoroughly searched. We knew whoever had done this had access to his back. And so that told us that whoever did this had access to the keys prior to the homicide. Whoever killed Norma Rodriguez knew her well, apparently moving in and out of her house at will. Detectives believe they have at least one other hot lead to follow. One that involves an eyewitness to the crime problem is only four years old. One of the people I interviewed was the victim's son, Austin, who was age four at the time. On June 4th, Detective Ron Burns and a child psychologist sit down with Norma Rodriguez's second son, Austin. The child was home with his mother all weekend and detectives believe might have actually witnessed the attack. That part of the interview is the part where I talked about what he has seen regarding the tape around his mother's face. What was she saying? Remember what she said to me? Oh, what was she screaming? You don't know. In this case, I got to the point where he's gonna be able to tell me the name of a person he saw putting the tape on his mother's face and without any names out there. This was a name that he brought up. Do you know what that person with her about? What color in the way do we establish? As far as he knows what he's telling us that this time is only one person involved. Police believe that person to be Warren Mackey. A former co-worker, and friend of Enormous. Just as the case begins to gel, however, four-year-old Austin produces a second name. This is what he had to say about the second person involved. Sure, and that threw us a curveball because the first person identified as a white man, and it was that man alone. Then he indicated there was a black man also involved. Police believe the second man, also to be a co-worker of enormous investigators need to locate both men and ask them a few hard questions. I don't want. Detective Sergeant Strata four days after talking to Austin Rodriguez, the detective sit down with Warren Mackey and asked him about Norma. Mackey was a close friend of the victim. She went to interview him and see what he has to say about where he was, what he was doing. That particular night. We have a bar or something. On the night Norma was killed, Mackey claims he was out on the town, and stayed out until early the next morning. It was probably between one. 30 in the morning because we left right before closing down. Mackey's friends substantiate his alibi, at least for the time being, with some cover. Investigator Darren Schindler runs down the second man mentioned by Austin at the local Kmart he was pretty cooperative. We asked if he was responsible for her death. He told us no. 
he passed a polygraph test. There was nothing to indicate that he was being untruthful with us at all. With their two best suspects on the back burner, detectives decide they need to take a fresh look at the case. We right away started looking at her inner circle of friends, Um's husband, their brother-in-law also her ex-boyfriends. We can recall being extremely frustrated because there were a number of potential suspects. However, no one really surfaced at that time. If it was a horse race, nobody really came out ahead. They were all neck and neck. Potential suspects are asked to take a polygraph. All agree, and each, in turn, passes questioning that expands to neighbors and casual friends. To be honest, I have no idea who it might be. The one thing you want to do is keep your thoughts, ideas, everything wide open, so that you don't miss something. It's very frustrating because it's, the momentum. Is there a first? But then kind of wanes after a while? Because one dead end after another and you try and keep that moment. I'm going, and it is a very difficult time. In time, the investigation slows and the case goes cold until a scientist turns on the TV, and finds a clue that just might stick. After Norma Rodriguez was strangled in her home in 1993 police were left with little evidence, and only one witness. The problem was that the witness was enormous, four-year-old son Austin. While investigators certainly viewed Austin's memories as valuable, it was hard to know just how reliable a four-year-old could be as a witness to a murder. Austin gave detectives two names of the men he saw murdering his mother. But alibis, and polygraph seemed to tell a different story. That meant if there was any hope of solving this case, it was going to have to be from a forensic breakthrough. Nine years after enormous murder. That breakthrough came in the spring of 2002. Investigator Dennis Fitzgerald opens up the evidence files on the murder case of Norma Rodriguez. They're searching for traces of the killer's DNA, and began by looking under the victim's fingernails 10 years ago. We couldn't have submitted those fingernails for DNA processing. It just wasn't there. So that becomes pretty huge, these are the fingernail clippings from one of Norma Rodriguez's hands in May of 2002. Forensic scientist Shannon Barrios takes custody of fingernail clippings taken from the hands of a corpse almost 10 years prior. Barrios tells detectives she's hopeful she will be able to extract DNA. Then she gets to work. Yeah, what I would do to get the DNA off these fingernail clippings is I take a swab. This is a swab, and I just wet it with water, so I would swap the undersurface, and then I would turn the clipping over, and I would swab the top surface. And then I take that swab, and I do a DNA extraction on it. The extraction produces two genetic profiles. It was a mixture of DNA from Norma, and a second contributor. Sure enough, there is a profile underneath her right fingernails that is an unknown male. This was a huge break for us. I knew once that happened that the chances of solving this case were really big. The unknown profile has entered into CODIS a DNA databank made up mostly of convicted felony offenders but fails to generate a match. Detectives reach out to Richard Simon, a prosecutor for the Ventura County District Attorney's Office, to help them work the profile. To that point, Dennis and I put together a list of people that were friends, and acquaintances of Rodriguez, and these were people who wanted to get DNA from to see if we could get a match. Warren Mackey was one of two men I did by Norma's son as being in the house on the day Norma was killed in 1993. Both men offered alibis. Now investigators send Mackey's DNA, along with samples from other suspects, back to the lab for comparison testing. On June 1st, I believe, of 2003, 10 years to the day we get a hit. I was jumping up and down people in the adjoining offices could hear me. They're wondering what's going on. But, that's when Sean Barrios called me and told me that we have a match. It's Warren Mackey. Warren Mackey's DNA found under the fingernails of a murder victim. Cold case investigators are excited, but cautious. I mean, it was pretty good, but we needed to eliminate any other possible explanations. I know down the line, sometimes he a light would come on and he would say, now I remember she ran her fingers through my hair or she did this or that to explain a way that DNA investigators would like a second piece of forensic evidence, one that would inextricably bind Warren Mackey to the murder victim. We're looking at the heart and soul of this case. At the request of cold case detectives, 
a forensic scientist at Johns pulls out a length of duct tape used to wrap the head of murder victim Norma and prepares it for DNA testing. This piece of tape would have been 20 feet long. When it was originally applied to the victim, it would have been wrapped around 14 times around her head. The area that I start with would be the beginning. In the end, the beginning, and the end. Jones has watched enough TV to know that these are the areas most likely to have been handled by the killer. When I was channel surfing one day, I saw somebody in the process of wrapping somebody up with duct tape. Then I saw her go up like this shirt to tear it terrific. And that's the obvious thing that you'd be looking for is saliva on their saliva is a very rich source of DNA. A single DNA profile is developed from each end of the tape. It is a perfect match to Mackie, and the final piece to a case for murder. So, that means on both ends of the duct tape, we have his DNA, so he could have told us anything he wanted. But I don't know how he could explain his DNA buried 20 feet deep into that roll of duct tape. Whoever finishes that roll wrapped it around her face. And then either Tori, with her teeth or with her hands, left their DNA on the duct tape. At the end of the roll. That was the killer way. Knew we had the right person. We just wanted to afford him an opportunity to explain. On August 27th, investigators Dennis Fitzgerald and Danny Thompson escort Warren Mackey into an interview room. Obviously, the main thing we want to do is see if we could get him to admit to what he had done and why he did it. That's what we want to know. Fitzgerald moves from fingernails to duct tape, and a report that will put Warren Mackey away for a long time. And that ends the interview and we arrest him on the warrant. Warren Mackey is charged with killing Norma Rodriguez. Five months later, he pleads guilty to second-degree murder but never offers an explanation as to why. There's some speculation on that. I think that he had a romantic interest in her.